Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. I want to show you some universal Parkinson's disease rating scale scores. The flag points are scores that were reported to me by various specialists over the last 23 years. Higher numbers are worse than low numbers. You see the numbers go up for about 13 years. Then they start to come down over a period of two years by about 80%. And the numbers have stayed at this low level for the past seven years. I hope you're asking, so what has this person with Parkinson's been doing the last nine years? And will it work for other persons with Parkinson's disease? Will it work for me? Will it work for my patients? I can answer the first question about what changes this person made over the last nine years. This is my trajectory for 23 years of Parkinson's disease. I can explain what I was thinking at the time and what I have learned since then to explain why or how five simple lifestyle changes work. The second question is, will it work for others? I don't have a good answer for that question, but I have some strong opinions about how it should be tested. I first noted tremors in my right hand in the year 2000. I was convinced I had Parkinson's disease and went to a specialist. I had a tremor in my right hand and leg. I stopped swinging my right arm when I walked. My fingers on my right hand did something called pill rolling. My printing became very small. I lost some of my sense of smell. I could not remember things like phone numbers I was trying to dial. Instead of looking at a whole phone number, I would have to read the area code, dial those three numbers, then the next three numbers, and then the last four numbers. I had the three classic symptoms of tremor, bradykinesia, or slow movement, and rigidity. I went to see Dr. Shulman at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and she confirmed that I had Parkinson's disease and that I would most likely have 10 good years of control through medication, and there was time for research to come up with something that might change that prognosis. The medication would help the symptoms, but it would not do anything to stop the progression. Ten years passed. My cognitive problems worsened. The tremor spread to the left side and even got worse than on the right side. I was unable to continue to work at a high-level job as a risk analyst and system designer at one of the world's largest financial institutions. Finding myself with time on my hands, I volunteered for Dr. Shulman's exercise study. This was one of the earliest studies of exercise in Parkinson's disease, and it was just a fortunate coincidence that my doctor was the principal investigator. I got assigned to the group doing weightlifting and stretching. I got stronger, my muscles changed, but I did not see any impressive changes in my Parkinson's disease. But the experience got me thinking, how can exercising muscles influence the brain? There was a book called Spark that suggested there was a link between exercise and intelligence. It argued certain types of athletes, but not all athletes, made better grades as a group. Why did girls cross-country runners who got up early in the morning to run before school tend to have better grades? The book mentioned something that could cause changes in individual neurons. The substance was brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. Was it possible that some form of exercise could stimulate the production of BDNF? I also had the idea that ketone bodies might be produced in the morning exercise and that these would enter the brain and cause changes. I had read a study by Ted Van Italy where patients were put on ketogenic diet. Some aspects of the UPDRS score improved an average of 40%. Perhaps you've heard of the great success of reversing childhood epilepsy with the ketogenic diet. So here's what happened. Charlie got sick with horrible epilepsy. He failed all the available drugs and brain surgery didn't work to stop his seizures. And eventually uh, we found the ketogenic diet in a library. We put Charlie on the ketogenic diet and the seizures went away. I proposed a little test to see if using exercise to cause ketosis could upregulate BDNF and increase ketone bodies and perhaps do something for Parkinson's disease. 
In order to make ketones when I exercised, I assumed I would have to let my glycogen levels drop overnight. Glycogen is a storage form of glucose, and you will find it in your muscles, in your brain, and in your liver. As you fast overnight, the glycogen starts to get used up. If you exercise in the morning while you are still fasting, you may produce ketone bodies and BDNF. So I tested this fasted morning exercise. I did high intensity interval training every morning, which means I sprinted for about a minute and then I jogged or walked for about one or two minutes, repeating this for about 20 minutes, warming up and cooling down by walking. At the time, I was suffering from severe fatigue. I remember I was trying to wash the windows on my small car the Saturday before I started the fasted morning exercise. I felt I could barely finish. I started the fasted exercise during that week. Then on Saturday, I worked for four hours chopping and digging out roots from an oak tree after the tree was taken down and the stump removed. The difference was amazing. The next logical question was, what would happen if I exercised without fasting? My next test was to see if taking glucose before morning exercise would kill the effect. The glucose would prevent my body from making ketone bodies for energy. I was two days into my testing when my wife asked, what happened to your magic exercise? I told her with great enthusiasm about my experiment. She promptly demanded that I end the glucose experiment and go back to the magic exercise. The carbs kept me from going into ketosis and killed the effect that the fasted exercise in the morning had on my Parkinson's disease. I had more time when I stopped working, and one of the things I did was go and visit a scientist at NIH who I had corresponded with about my exercise. His name was Dr. Veach, and he had written about ketones and exercise. Dr. Veach had been a student of Hans Krebs of the Krebs cycle or tricarboxylic acid cycle. Dr. Veach had an edible form of ketone bodies that was being developed by the military to eat when they were on missions. Dr. Veach thought that his ketone ester could be taken as a food. Dr. Veach wanted to study the effect of ketone ester on free radical damage caused by radiation. A few doses given 24 hours after an LD70 dose of radiation protected mice almost completely from radiation. Nineteen rowers took a single dose of ketone ester before sitting down to row for half an hour. There was one world record, several personal bests, and several season bests from these elite rowers. Only one did slightly better on the placebo. A friend who started law school in his 50s took it before a practice LSAT, and his score went from one unit above the mean score to the 90th percentile when he took the ketone ester before taking the test. You can do MRI studies and make a 45-year-old brain look just like a young brain simply by giving ketone ester. The ketone ester was still in development and the FDA had not yet approved grass status, generally regarded as safe. I was thinking at that time that it would be important to increase my ketone bodies. Since the ketone ester was not available yet, I tried to raise my ketone body levels in other ways. One day I was sitting in Dr. Veach's office and he printed out an email and handed it to me. The email said that people were getting blood ketone boosts by drinking coffee with three tablespoons of grass-fed cream, three tablespoons of grass-fed butter, and three tablespoons of coconut oil. I drank the buttered coffee in the morning and recorded my symptoms every hour. At the end of the day, I looked back at the symptoms. Bradykinesia, gone. Pain in my back, gone. Dystonia in my feet, gone. Tremor, gone. Slow thinking, gone. The only symptom that did not go away for the day within an hour of drinking the coffee was L-DOPA induced dyskinesia. I should note that I only used two tablespoons of cream, a tablespoon of organic grass-fed butter, and one tablespoon of coconut oil in my coffee today. The only problem I still had was dyskinesia. Dyskinesia did not become a symptom associated with Parkinson's disease until people started taking L-DOPA. I should point out that the exercise and intermittent fasting and the special fats in the coffee did not reduce my need for traditional Parkinson's disease medications. Shortly after I plotted all my symptoms for several days after starting the buttered coffee, I had an appointment with Dr. Schulman. I wanted to show her what I had experienced. I started the day visiting Dr. Veach. I went to a buffet 
and put some beef and chicken and fish on my plate. I really overdid the protein. When I arrived at the afternoon appointment with Dr. Shulman, my symptoms were terrible. I did not know why I had this result. My friend Miriam Kalamian is an expert nutritionist and works with cancer patients who want to try a ketogenic diet as adjunctive therapy. She told me that the protein consumed in such large amounts turns mostly into glucose. I had noticed that if I started my day out with an overnight fast, drank the buttered coffee, and exercised in the fasted state, I would be able to go without notable symptoms except for the times when I ate lots of carbohydrates or excessive protein. I also noticed that I only had one window where it was possible to start the trend, and that was in the morning. Nothing I tried could restore my condition if I lost it during the day. I had to wait for another morning to come around. This is pretty much the extent of my interventions, with one exception. The ketone ester of Dr. Veach became available to purchase as a food supplement. So I tried ketone ester by itself, and it did not appear to do anything. When I took the ketone ester in combination with other interventions, it totally relieved a minor problem I had with urinary incontinence. It also reversed ED. It has been shown in this study to allow persons with Parkinson's to exercise more intensely and longer. I also find that it can help me think and speak, and if I know I'm going to have a stressful day, I will take it a few times during the day. So that was all seven years ago. These are five processes that go bad in Parkinson's disease. They can all be fixed to some degree, and I'm about to tell you how the processes get fixed. These processes are likely upstream from alpha-synuclein aggregation neuroinflammation and neuron death, which are much more difficult to reverse. There's a great deal of interest in the longevity community in NAD and intermittent fasting and circadian rhythms. I did not have these in mind when I chose the various lifestyle changes. However, in retrospect, I can see that I was very lucky to choose what may be the best way anyone can raise their NAD and NADPH levels. The circadian clock is driven by promoters that turn on different genes at different times of the day. Clock and BMAL1 turn on genes in the light phase of the circadian rhythms. Here we see a cartoon of the vicious cycle to make NAD. This molecule is NAD. This enzyme controls the salvage pathway of making NAD. NAD is used by CERT1, which activates BMAL1. You don't have to understand what all these things are, you just have to realize that in the morning, if you fast overnight, kickstart ketosis with some morning fat consumption, you're going to feed into this vicious cycle and make more NAD. If you exercise, you're going to make the enzyme NAMPT that makes more NAD. If a person exercises in the morning, it would map right into this feed-forward control to upregulate more NAD. NADPH is made from NAD, so if you make more NAD, you should also make more NADPH. NADPH powers all the antioxidants. There's a pattern found in the way that all antioxidants work. They donate an electron to a free radical to quench the free radical. However, in donating an electron, they become free radicals themselves. In order to work again, they must have the electron restored. NADPH is the ultimate source of all these electrons. If you don't have enough NADPH, you will not protect lipids and proteins and DNA and RNA from attack by free radicals. NADPH restores neurotransmitter synthesis. Electrons are required in the synthesis of dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. In the synthesis of serotonin, melatonin, and in the synthesis of nitric oxide. Glucose can turn off NADPH production. If you're not producing enough NADPH, your neurotransmitter synthesis would slow down and you would experience more symptoms. Glucose turns on insulin and stimulates fatty acid synthesis. Each time you add two carbons to the growing fatty acid chain, you need two NADPH. Making fatty acids depletes NADPH. This would explain why my symptoms got worse when eating carbohydrates. Lipostasis is homeostasis of lipids. Two of the most important lipids are cardiolipins found in the inner membrane of mitochondria 
and plasmalogens which are found in the cell membranes of neurons, oligodendrocytes, and Schwann cells. They each have critical roles to play. Without cardiolipin, the mitochondria could not maintain a proton gradient which is needed for the production of ATP. Without plasmalogens, it is impossible to form functional vesicles of neurotransmitters that can bind to the cell membrane at the synapse and merge with the cell membrane to release neurotransmitters. The ability for oligodendrocytes to wrap around nerve axons to form myelin is also dependent on the special properties conveyed by plasmalogen. Both of these lipids must be made in adequate quantities and protected from oxidation and removed when they get oxidized. The cardiolipins are made by mitochondria. The ability to regenerate mitochondria and the ability to select damaged mitochondria for removal is critical for the lipostasis of cardiolipins. The plasmalogens are made in peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are organelles that are made when the cell is exposed to different carbon sources. There are peroxisome proliferator activating receptors that come in a few variants. PPAR gamma has fatty acids as their ligand. It may be that the high concentration of oleate in grass-fed butter or some of the mid-chain fatty acids in coconut oil cause the proliferation of peroxisomes which would make fresh plasmalogens. It is something to test for in a clinical trial to see if your plasmalogen and cardiolipin levels change. Both lipids are protected from free radical oxidative attacks by NADPH through antioxidant provision of electrons. Proteostasis is the homeostasis of proteins. It is critical to prevent alpha-synuclein accumulation. There are numerous clearing mechanisms in the cell. All of these require ATP. If your mitochondria are not working well, this may cause problems. If we leave out the possibility of eating your own muscles and protein for energy, your body has three choices for energy. Glucose, fatty acids, and ketone bodies. Oxidative phosphorylation can run on glucose or fatty acids or beta-hydroxybutyrate. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is ideal as a rescue fuel. Both glucose and fatty acids require initial ATP be used before any new ATP can be made. Beta-hydroxybutyrate does not require an initial ATP before it starts to make new ATP. Both glucose and fatty acids have gateways to oxidative phosphorylation that are under control of many homeostatic processes. For glucose, the gateway is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. For fatty acids, it is the carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 that can block fatty acids. Beta-hydroxybutyrate is not under any homeostatic control to keep it from entering the mitochondria and producing ATP. There's no gateway that can be shut down remotely. So beta-hydroxybutyrate has properties that make it ideal for rescuing ATP production. It does not require insulin to let it into the cells or lipoprotein carrier systems to get it moved from the cell to cell, because it is water-soluble. These properties allow beta-hydroxybutyrate to turn on worn-out mitochondria in the brain and get them producing ATP, ATP that is needed to remove damaged proteins. Another problem process in Parkinson's disease is the failure of mitochondrial quality control. There are up to 2 million mitochondria in a single dopaminergic neuron. They live less than a month on average. It's critical that the worn-out mitochondria be removed and the new ones be made to replace them. It appears that the designer drug mishap with MPP plus caused the best mitochondria to be selected for mitophagy. This is exactly the opposite of mitochondrial quality control. We reason that Parkinson's disease can be caused to progress by the gradual deterioration of the quality of mitochondria. This is a vicious cycle. The worse the quality, the less energy is available, and the less the removal and replacement work. We further reason that if mitochondria quality control can be improved, Parkinson's can be reversed to some extent. If caught early enough, perhaps it could be nearly totally reversed, or the onset could be perhaps prevented.
This paper that was published in November of 2022 attempts to explain how all these lifestyle changes come together to improve mitochondrial quality control. I only have time to point you to the paper I have written with my co-authors Dr. Mark Matson, Dr. William Seeds, and Dr. Bradshaw. The paper proposes a mechanism for selecting the worst mitochondria for mitophagy. This is optimized by NADPH through DJ1. Hydrogen peroxide is the messenger that activates DJ1. Hydrogen peroxide is made from superoxide reacting to superoxide tismutase, which turns superoxide into oxygen and hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide is free to leave the mitochondrion as a messenger to DJ1. Superoxide stays inside the mitochondrion. If the level of superoxide is high, it is a flag or sentinel that tells which mitochondria to eat by mitophagy. The signal being sent to DJ1 activates the needed external trigger that can identify the flagged mitochondria. The free radical gas nitric oxide can be produced inside the neuron or from outside by microglia. When the nitric oxide finds superoxide, it cascades into the production of free radicals that eventually rid the mitochondria of their ability to provide a proton gradient. This triggers Pink 1 and Parkin to do their part in building a scaffolding the phagophore will attach to and begin mitophagy. Meanwhile, Pink 1 and Parkin stop suppressing Paris, allowing biogenesis gene transcription to start making new mitochondria. The point of all this is that adequate NADPH is critical in allowing DJ1 to restore mitochondrial quality control. All these mechanisms are synergistically optimized by intermittent fasting, taking a variety of fats in the morning, exercising both aerobically and using resistance, and taking some ketone ester before working out and avoiding carbohydrates and levels of protein that exceed the body's needs. I want to talk a bit about the clinical trial it will take to make this evidence-based medicine. The first point is that you are going to have to test all five interventions as one study. This is not only because the metabolic science says they are intrinsically linked, but also based on my experience. As I have mentioned previously, I only had one window in the morning to make everything come together. Also, if I did not do all five of the interventions together, they did not work as well. For those still wishing to separate out individual inventions, I ask you to ponder how long it would take to test all five combinations. For five interventions, there are five factorial treatment combinations to test. That is 120. It is the unique perfect storm that comes from all five interventions acting together that must be tested. There's just one last hurdle keeping us from making this evidence based medicine. I was talking with Michael Schwarzschild, the principal investigator for the study to see if raising urate levels would slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. When he heard that Ted Van Italy found an average improvement of 40% in UPDRS, he said, the best statistical methods to prove disease modifications would not respond well to an intervention that changed the symptoms so dramatically. By using the best protocol for measuring true modification, the progression rate of Parkinson's we find that we rule out the possibility of detecting significant modification. I came across a similar problem in my job in financial services. The bank used models of auto loans and credit card loans to calculate loan loss reserve. These models were applied to student loans. They failed to predict the loan losses. In fact, they gave answers that were off by close to 300%. I used forecast modeling with machine learning and improved the measurement to the point I could predict within 2% the actual future loan loss of student loans. This was a greater than 200-fold improvement over the best models that were brought over from card loans or auto loans. I think we're going to have to do something similar for measuring disease modification. So I've told you about the five lifestyle interventions, the five processes that they can modify, and suggested some ways to test it. I need to ask the community, should we be looking into having a clinical trial? How can patients safely work with their doctors and find nutritionists and physical therapists to help them start today? I would like to thank my co-authors and my friend, the late Richard Veach, who helped me figure out the science that may explain my positive experience with disease modification.